station. Observe the octagonal logo in the upper right corner. This is the same image found on the job posting. We have found hundreds of invoices for enough supplies to sustain a colony for quite some time. But not all items purchased make sense. Strange requests and purchase orders that cover the most unusual spectrum of mystery. 1.4 tons of seeds, ammunition for M1 carbines, pneumatic tubing, animal care supplies, zookeeper supplies, electronics, televisions, speakers, wires, but enough to service a town, electromagnetic coils and Tesla coils, psychotropic drugs, other pharmacological supplies, and soft restraints. Ostensibly, the church is responsible for the procurement of these strange wares. However, our reporters' investigation into the church's financial records have proven there is nothing unusual. Furthermore, a stunning discovery is that the church does not own the very land it sits on. Research into the landowner's name has led our intrepid team to discover a dizzying array of shell companies that have ordered all the unusual supplies. Our investigation brought us to this man, a behavioral psychologist who works at a Los Angeles clinic he too claims he was interrogated by the Dharma Initiative. He did not wish to be identified. My name is I'm a behavioral psychologist with a strong background in pharmacology. The interviews were intense. They also interviewed my colleague. He was a chemist. His name was Olden or something or other. They asked me questions about every facet of my job, everything I've ever learned, or drug reactions, side effects, even things we were still researching, classified research. Ludovico, etc. The Ludovico technique. It's where a subject is repeatedly told a series of phrases or images, and upon repetition, the subject may eventually believe they are true. Some believe this may be called brainwashing. All the point, but I considered everything, and I didn't think it was a humanitarian mission at all. When it came to my ethics and values, it, it crossed the line. I thought it was a cult. Not religious, but certainly had the same feel and, and, and actions of a cult. Ammunition, drugs, tranquilizers, but perhaps the strangest of all, submarine fuel. What type of organization would maintain and operate a submarine fleet? Why would they need one? The only time a submarine is used for clandestine purposes and operations is to sneak in and out of contestant waters under the cover of liquid night. During World War II, submarines were regularly used for transport to areas in the non-industrial locations in the South Pacific not suitable for large ships. Many of these vessels were lost at sea. But could they also be stolen or bought on the black market by the Dharma Initiative? Seemingly limitless resources and tendrils that touch every corner of society. More when we return. Sunday here on ABC. We now return to Mysteries of the Universe, the Dharma Initiative. Many times, smaller organizations are controlled by a larger shadowy company, silent and hiding in the dark, but secretly funneling resources without a clear link. Much of what we have uncovered is layered in anecdotal evidence and legend. However, there are hard documented facts and several flesh and blood people that are pulling the strings. Our mysteries researchers have found a strong link between the Dharma Initiative and what could be a larger, more powerful force working behind the scenes, spearheaded by a man named Alvar Hanso. Who is this man? And what does he have to do with the Dharma Initiative? Details about Alvar Hanso are shrouded in mystery, but his reputation is made clear through public documents and records. A Danish World War II munitions profiteer, Alvar Hanso provided weapons and ammunition during the war to various resistance movements around Europe, earning him a large fortune. After the war, Alvar Hanso became the leading purveyor of high-technology armaments to NATO. 
Some say stopping only after what he felt was guilt and regret about profiting from war and destruction. However, before the war, Alvar Hanso attended the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor for a year as a foreign exchange student. There he lived with a family, the DeGroots, and developed an affinity for the local area. At that time, this man, Gerald DeGroot, was eight years old. It is said that Alvar found him precocious and charming. Curiously, when our research team tried to uncover DeGroote's college records, they found them to be expunged, erased from existence. Piecing together from second-hand resources, we deduced that Alvar's undergraduate degree was in chemistry from a university in Billund, Denmark. And he returned to a university in Michigan for a master's in engineering, quite possibly spending more time with the DeGroots and bonding with Gerald. We suspect the families stayed in touch over the years. Then, when Gerald was a graduate student in his search of financial backing for his project, the Dharma Initiative, he contacted his family friend, Alvar Hanso, for funding. Who exactly is Gerald de Groot? We tried to investigate further into the de Groot-Hanso connection, but were stymied at every turn. Our team went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, to this location of de Groot's laboratory, but were barred from entry. Barred from the truth. 